Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. You know, every time the phone rang, you're like, oh my, what, how, what have I done? What I mean, now? I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to do the best I can do, yeah. talking to people as straight as I can talk to them, and I'm in trouble again. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. 1987, a Ford engineer comes to you and tells you about this cat, Jack Roush, who is going to start a cup team. Were you familiar with Jack at the time, and was Mark Martin also a part of the package? Mark was driving that Bush car with Hoosier Tires help, and they kept it just a. I lived like seven miles above Level Cross, and the shop was like three miles above Level Cross. So I'd go by and see Mark and see what's going on, because I had... A lot of respect for Mark. I, I thought he had what it took. So I'd go by and check him out and all that. Well, we had gotten together, and we had actually tried to put together a couple of programs with other people on our own. Because at that time, a million and a half dollars was plenty of money to do it. You know, you'd, you'd be just fine if you did all the right things. A million and a half. A million and a half. So <laughs> I was leaving Michigan. I was in the parking lot getting ready to go, and, and a Ford engineer named Paul Giltman, who worked for was helping uh, Harry and Air's team with mm-hmm. Kale. Uh, I thought he did a fantastic job because I, I knew what springs were running and, and shock absorbers, and I thought, man, that's some kind of revolutionary stuff they're doing that this Ford guy knows what he's talking about. So he stopped me and he said, hey, do you have any interest in working on a Ford team with a really hooked-in Ford guy? I said, yeah, sure, whatever we need to do. Because Fords were, you know, uh, Robert Yates was running fast and Harry yeah. and Air's cars were running yeah. fast, and it looked like... Ford engine program worked well, and the banjo cars were just wonderful at the time, and the bodies were slick. I said, yeah, 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 let's do it. One day, Jack Roush called me and said, hey, think about if you want to do this. Jack had spoken with Gary Nelson, and I th- yeah, Gary was still racing at the time, and yeah. they wanted, he wanted Gary Nelson. Right. And Gary said, no, but I got a guy that worked with me uh, that I think you should talk to, and he's, it was Robin Pemberton, who I grew up with in New York. And... Uh, Jack made a call to Robin, and Robin said, well, yeah, I don't want to really step off and do that on my own, but if you'll go hire my buddy Steve. So I was actually like the third choice. And uh, we all got together at the Holiday Inn about by the airport in Greensboro and didn't really have a giant plan, but just knew what, what Jack wanted to do and how much influence he had with Ford Motor Company, and Ford was really signed up with it. The Ford SVO people came down on the airplane with them. And... Uh, we just started. What was your role? We bought 24 acres of land in a building in Liberty, North Carolina. So there was a lot to be done there. So I said, Rob, you just worry about the race cars, and I'll get everything else up and running, buying equipment and, you know, just all kinds of things, scheduling wind tunnel tests and stuff like that. But Rob and I talked about the race cars together all the time in addition to that. But it was a very interesting situation because – Ford was going to spend a lot of money with Jack, and Jack had a huge reputation already as far back as Gap and Roush and then his protofab race cars, uh, IMSA cars and Trans Am cars. So, yeah. you know, this thing had to work very well. But, so the Ford engineers kind of kept an eye on us, and uh, they'd come down to visit, and they'd s- go back up home and tell SVO, well, their building isn't big enough and they're not really ready. And boy, I'm not, you know, they need to be in Mooresville. And oh, it was rough. And then we went to the wind tunnel and got in there with our first super speedway car. And uh, the Ford guy there, unbeknownst to me, called Jack and told him what a terrible race car these guys had put together and we've been worried about these guys anyway you know wow okay. so jack calls me he says what's going on i said nothing man we're fine i said i'm looking at the numbers we're you know we're not cutting flips it's not the greatest speedway car that's ever been in here but it's in the top three of the fords you know well i didn't know that you know so so that kind of started a situation where people that jack had known for a long time were telling him maybe we didn't know what we were doing and i had the job of telling him no we're good so that would you know, if you put yourself in Jack's shoes, he's like, man, I barely know this guy. Maybe he's just blowing smoke, and I've known these guys since 1965, right. yeah. and, you know, I, I trust them. But luckily for me, those guys were kind of wrong. <laughs> but, but, it, it, but it did start a situation where Jack was uneasy. He wasn't signed up on everything I did. 
you know, uh, it, it was it was interesting. And then Jack invited Robin and I to go to the banquet. And yeah, I guess so. For after he said, well, they're going to make a little announcement up there. We want you to be there. Okay. Well, we had planned on doing what you guys will remember Harry Rainier did at the time, you know, Daytona, Skip Richmond and Rockingham, Atlanta, right. Skip here, go there. No road racing, no short tracks, no miles, you know. So that's what we're doing. So that's what we're gearing up to do. So you're going into 88 expecting to run a limited schedule. Oh, we're, we're going into December expecting to run that. <laughs> <laughs> so we get up wow. there and they make this big announcement and we're like, do what now? <laughs> Jack said, ah, yeah, I meant to say something about that, but it, you know. So we just jumped through our butts and got it done. But that kind of got myself and Robin going, well, maybe we're not being told everything e either. So it got, you know yeah, what I mean? It got, yeah, a, yeah. it got a little rocky. You know, it, was, it made it tough for Jack and it made it tough for Robin and myself because he didn't know who to, who to believe and we didn't know who to believe and we didn't know when the next shoe was going to fall, he, you know, so... So that kind of started everything off on a little bit of a wrong foot. Yeah. 1988, you don't win. No, no. Now, it, how big a problem was that, or was that a problem? It wasn't so much that we didn't win. There was a lot of times we didn't even run good. You, you know, the, okay. high, yeah. the highlight of our year was one, uh, one pole at Dover in the spring or maybe the fall, I don't know. But we went to Sears Point because Jack was a road racer. You yeah. Know? And he brought Lee White, who ran all that road racing up there, and later went to work for TRD. G great guy, great racer. And uh, Jack says, I'm bringing Lee out with me, and he's going to help you with the road race car. I said, man, that's cool, whatever help we need. So we went out there, and we went out and ran, and ran, and ran, and ran, and ran. Yeah, how is it? It's good. All right, I want you to put Lee, do whatever Lee tells you to do. Okay. So we had to take some front weight out of it, and, you know, it's got to be 50-50 and even side to side and all that stuff and go out there and knock yourself out. So we ran, like, a second slower. And Jack said, what's going on? And Mark said, uh, he, he, you know, he didn't want to say anything. Jack's the new kid. He was tickled to death to have the opportunity, he, you know. And as much as I was third in line to be the crew chief, Mark originally was, like, fifth or sixth in line Jack's choice as a driver, you know, so he's not going to rock the boat. And uh, finally, he says, it's just too loose. And Lee said, well, that, it can't be. That's how we run all our cars. And I said, Lee, you got way more downforce. And the biggest thing is your rear tires are twice as wide as ours yeah. compared to your fronts. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Your fronts are similar, but your rears are huge. And he said, well, just switch it back if you think it's right, if it's not right. So we switched it back, went back to running really, really good. And from that point on, we were a good little road race team for, for Jack. But that was one more thing where Jack brought a guy that he really respected, and we really respected, and the proof wasn't in the pud, and it's like, well, maybe these guys are messing with me. He, he, you know, it's like, no, we're not messing with me. So you got me and Robin over here going, man, wonder why you, we even have to do this. We know what we're doing. You got Jack going, well, I've proved I know what I'm doing because I've got all these Trans Am and IMSA titles. Yeah. So, you know, it was one more thing where you kind of, you didn't really clang together. We didn't have a fist fight or scream and shout, but it's like, like, man, every time we turn around, you know, we're getting dinged in the head. And, and both sides are saying that. Right. So... So just, how, how big a relief was it when Mark finally won a race at Rockingham in 1989? Yeah, we had threatened a lot. I mean, we, yeah. we were so sick of, again, back to Dover, so sick of running second to Dale Earnhardt at Dover. Back when they used to put the sealer on the asphalt, you know, yeah. and it's, you'd smoke the tires and God, fantastic race. We couldn't beat them, couldn't beat them, and couldn't beat them. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we raced good all day at Rockingham. Uh, came down to a caution with like probably 40 to go. And uh, we beat, uh, Mark beat him on the start, and then Rusty and Dale got to racing the daylights out of each other, and that let us get away, and we won the race. And that, that was a huge relief. Uh, but I will say that in 88, I think from a conversation Jack had with me in his office, probably December of 88, that... I think the sponsors in Ford Motor Company, I know they did, but Jack didn't bring this up, but he was, he, I think he had promised to win some races, like a number of races, yeah, wow. and, and it didn't all work out. You know? and, and we were virtually there because, according to the Ford people, they were spending a lot of money with the Elliots, but the Elliots wouldn't tell them anything, which 
I wouldn't have either. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So they looked at Jack as a guy who's right down the street. And originally the race team was supposed to run out of Livonia, Michigan, right there by Dearborn, which nobody was going to go up there and do that. But they looked as they could go down the street and the four guys could go down the street and see what's going on and talk to Jack and talk to the guys and, you know, see, what, see what's happening and what the new stuff coming out is and all that. And it just, that hadn't worked out either. So there was a couple dings against us and Jack with Ford Motor Company and Stroll Light, which I think Stroll Light was brought by Ford because at that time they were on Glidden's car and they were on some Jack's road racers. And so I think that was tied in with Ford Motor Company. So everything was predicated on Ford Motor Company's interest in what we were doing. We didn't give them a lot of information. We didn't win a lot of races. So th- that made it tough. But when we won a race in 89, as I said, we had, we had challenged a lot. And fortunately, we won one. And we actually went to Atlanta with a – we were th- – the top three in points and had a chance to ultimately win the championship, yeah. which we, we blew up about halfway through the race. But anyway, it was like, man, these guys were 15th in points and really didn't do a lot last year. And now they're third. Well, that also got the ears up of the competitors and they were nervous about us getting in their backyard. Some people still thought we raced out of Michigan and they're like, boy, a bunch of Yankees coming down and whipping us. <laughs> this isn't going to work. And these guys are really starting to roll along, which is has a lot to do with what happened at Richmond the following spring. Yeah. Okay, yeah, speaking of that. Richmond, <laughs> I will always, always, always say that Mark Martin is the 1990 Winston Cup champion. He's got everything but the ring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, February of 1990, you go to Richmond, you win the race, and then all hell breaks loose in inspection. What happened? Well, it actually started at Daytona. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Um. We went through the templates, and at the time, they didn't have the little blocks and all yeah. the things to be, you know, go, no, go, gauge kind of thing. It was Buster, and Buster would say, yeah, your name. So we go through the templates, and they throw the overall up on the car, and I about threw up. I mean, it missed the back of the roof an inch, which <laughs> is exactly opposite of what you would do because you don't want more yeah. air attaching yeah. to the roof and going down and hitting the spoiler. You want, you know, you kind of puff the back of the roof up, and I'm like... I said, man, I swear. And Jack's like, what is that all about? And I said, Jack, I, I swear to you, man, I, it, it wasn't like that at the shop. I mean, and it, this went on for a day while we're fixing it. Well, finally, I heard that Robin and the guys, while I wasn't there, had lowered the back of the roof at the shop. Okay, you know, Robin's a good hard racer. He's doing what all he can do. Well, Jack got so frustrated with the fact that there wasn't a go, no gauge kind of thing. And Buster was, could put an eye on something to tell you was right or not right, that Jack took the job of going and standing in, in, the, in the room of doom and watching every car go through the templates. Well, that made NASCAR and Dick Beatty mad. You know, you're, what are you doing? I'm seeing. I'm, I'm going to see what we got going. So they're nervous about us running too good. Did the wrong thing and got caught. And instead of just quietly fixing the problem, we kind of showed our butts by standing around and watching with your arms crossed. And also, I put that on a couple people. But anyway, it's all okay. And then we went to Richmond. And Jack was concerned. It was so cold. You guys remember. I know you did. Yeah, it was yeah. incredibly cold. And, and Jack said, I'm nervous about the intake air. He said, tape the cowl shut. I was like, okay, that's what we'll do. So we taped the cowl shut and almost got lapped. I mean, it would not run. He said, what do you think it is? I said, we got to open the cowl. He said, no, no, I did this for real. So there's another time where I'm saying something and Jack is positive. You know, this is after we started the 1988 Daytona 500 with a flat fan and a shroud. So all that air coming in the front of the car, if you had an open, no shroud and an open back of the radiator, that may have worked, but... And I didn't know, we overheated on like the 17th lap. So I'm riding home with Robin and Mark. And I go, man, why did that thing get hot? And Rob said, it's got to be the flat fan. I said, what flat fan? He said, Jack had me put a flat fan. I said, well, you had to take the the shroud off because that was just a disc at the back of the shroud. And air's not coming through the radiator. He said, yeah, I know, but you weren't supposed to know. I'm like, oh my God, there's another one. You you know what I mean? It's like, so anyway, we almost got lapped and uh, went about tore the tape off, came flying up through the wren really well. And you're talking about it, Richmond. Yeah, excuse me. Okay, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. back to Richmond. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I'm, it's a one more preface, you know. Right. Cool. I, I'm back to, we're back to Richmond and uh, got the tape off the cowl. Jack's wondering if this is really going to work. We drive up through there and there's a pit stop with so many laps to go. And I think we got two tires and we got away from them and won the race. Okay. So 
Everybody's happy. It's freezing cold. Just get us out of here. So we're, as we're rolling the car into the garage to be torn down, we open the hood, and here comes Richard Childress from behind me. Not in a run, but in a rush. And he goes, it's right there, and points at something under the hood. And NASCAR comes and says, all y'all got to leave. Where's Jack? Holy cow, oh, man. Yeah, so we're like, I'm like, <laughs> what's going on? And uh, so we all leave. We go out in the truck, and we're just sitting. They said, don't come back in the garage here until we call you. And a little while later, Jack comes in the trailer, and he said, well, I figured in my NASCAR career sometime I'd get caught for cheating, but not for something as stupid as this. I said, what happened, Jack? He said, it's that spacer Robin told me to make. I said, what spacer Robin told you to make? He said, I made an inch and a half spacer and brought it to Robin so he could get the air cleaner close to the hood so the cow would work better. And I looked at Robin and said, Rob, that heaven? He said, yeah. He said, you know how Jack is? And he's beating on me about making sure we got all the horsepower we can get because Jack's engines were getting kicked in the teeth quite a bit at that time. He didn't really have his stock car legs under him. So, you know, Jack was pushing for every little detail. And rather than raise the engine or whatever, make a new cow, Robin called Jack. Jack went to his zillion-dollar machine shop up there that does incredible work and had him make an inch-and-a-half spacer. Jack brings it down on the airplane, hands it to Robin. Robin puts it on. I, I don't know anything about it. Hmm. And Richard obviously knew it. So we had been through inspection when we got there, inspection for qualifying, inspection for the race. Nobody said a word. It's got a seal on it. Race is over. We're in big trouble. So I'm like, man, so that's, there's another thing where you, you're supposed to be yeah. in charge yeah. and J- it, it, from both sides. You know, like Jack's like, man, the guy in... North Carolina told me to make the spacer. The other guy in North Carolina didn't know anything about it. I'm kind of stuck in the middle. It's just one more tense situation, you know, and it cost us 46 points. And I'll never forget, Les Richter called me in the deal, and he said, here's what we're going to do. The 46 points was based on the fact they made, I think they made us the last car on the lead lap. I think that's, that's yeah, where the that's point thing was. Yeah. And uh, I said, yeah, I hate that point thing. I said, I'd much rather pay money. He said, oh, good as you guys are running right now. Just beat him by more than 46 points. I said, okay. And we went on about our business. And ultimately, we didn't do it. But, right. you know, but, you know, we went, we ran well, won races, you know, did yeah. all the right things. And we couldn't beat, couldn't beat Dale Earnhardt. And I, I will forever be frustrated with the fact that Dale left pit road with his left side lug nuts loose. And the tires fell off. And they could run down there to the end of pit road. At and, Charlotte. At Charlotte. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and put them on. I'm like, that's unheard of, you know. And they were smart enough to know that if they waited on a record to tow them around, they'd be three laps down, even right. under caution. You know, but I was, I was screaming, like, what's going on? Well, then we went to North Wilkesboro the next week and beat Dale Earnhardt and, uh, with a setup that Banjo Matthews had given me and, uh, and a gear. And uh, we're like, oh, we're going to be okay now. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll go to Rockingham. For whatever reason, both teams went to Rockingham. The three and the six and were terrible. And then went to Phoenix, and we got tires late in the race, which was a big mistake on my part. Couldn't come back up through that. They had a bunch of wrecks in the last 10 laps. Holy, 100% my, my, my mistake. And then went to Atlanta with that nightmare deal, and yeah. that was just tough. Despite everything that happened at Richmond, you do go through the year, and still you have the lead in the standings for most of the second half of the season. I think we lost the lead after Richmond. Yeah. I think that's where we gave it up. Yeah. yeah. We, no, screwed. actually, you gave the lead up for the last time at Phoenix. Oh, I, I said Richmond. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Phoenix. Phoenix. Yes, at sir. Phoenix, Phoenix, where yeah. you had that I pit pitted stop. Wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we pitted wrong. Yeah. And then Mark crashes after the checkered flag, and yes. you, know, you go a few points down. Then you go to Atlanta for a test. That very next week. And yes. he gets in, I guess, one of Davey's cars and decides that he really likes it. And for whatever reason, you get one of Robert Yates' cars to actually run in Atlanta. We took like seven cars of ours to test at Atlanta. <laughs> Did you? Nuts. Really? Yeah. One was a new Ford design chassis, which SVO was very proud of. And it was a really nice little car, but it was built by engineers. And like, it, it took a long time to get the engine in and out. It, you almost couldn't get the oil tank out of it. You know, I mean, nice little race car, but we're our business it's thursday friday saturday thursday friday or, or excuse me friday saturday sunday friday saturday sunday and we had to go but we took it down there and tested and tested and tested and tested 
And there's this story out there that they put four lefts on the three car and they were three seconds faster than us. No, that, that, none of that's true. They were faster than us and they did go home early. But late in the afternoon of the second day, Robert Yates' truck came in from Phoenix and they unloaded the spare car or the race car, I'm not sure. And they were quite good right out of the truck. And for some reason, Mark got in it and drove it and was faster than any of our cars. And he said, I need that engine. I thought, oh boy, this isn't good because the, you know, the, the Jack Roush, Robert Yates thing was really tough at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, ah, it's probably not going to work out. He said, nah, that's what I want. Well, it's the last day of the test and we all let up and go home. Well, Jack calls the next day. He said, uh, I need you to go down there and get that car. I said, what car? He said, the one at Roberts. <laughs> he said, you can get it Friday, <laughs> which is the Friday... Good not a week before Atlanta. He said, "You got to paint it, and you, you, you know, you guys do what you need to do to it." And he said, it, "It's got an engine; in it. it'll have an engine in it." And I said, "Well, I thought we were just getting an engine." He said, "If you get the engine, you get the car." And no, was this a purchase or a no, borrowed? We it. Okay, we it. so I went down. Wow. So nobody else was involved. Took a dually and a trailer. Norman, the mayor, helped me load it. Every, Robert and those guys were gracious as can be. Here's what you need: try this, do this, do this. You know. Loaded it up, took it home, did body work and painted it over the weekend and starting to put it together on Monday morning. So we go down there and uh, we ran okay, not great, you know, not where I thought we'd be. The car was different from our car, um, but it was okay. It was a nice little race car. Uh, we push it out to qualify and the wiring harness burns out of it. We're like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> because yeah. our, our wiring harnesses were made by a fellow named Richard that worked on the Trans Am team in Livonia and that stuff would run a 24 hour race 10 times in a row right. so it was perfect you know all the connectors were aerospace and well here we are a bunch of wires are burned out like oh my god so we hook up a couple wires so it'll start and go out and qualify just okay you know and struggled throughout the weekend and really really didn't do anything good but you did finish sixth in that race as yeah, I call yeah, it. yeah you lost the championship to Dale by 26 right, points right. after a 46 point penalty yeah what was the mood after that race? Uh, we were just heartbroken, yeah. you know, and th the biggest problem was it ruined our... We did a horrible job of losing. In other words, 1991 was just a black hole. I don't think we won a race till late in the year. Yeah. I think we won Atlanta, the last race of yeah. the year, because yeah. we, we, we were just... It killed us. We showed a lot of immaturity as a team. I'll blame myself for that, because it was just, it was just so heartbreaking to lose that darn thing. You know, we... We thought we had it. And then the other thing that happened was uh, at the end, Jack explained why we got the car. And it was something about a superior steering box that we wanted and all that. And it, it didn't have anything to do with the steering box. It was just, if you're going to take that guy's car, you're going to take that guy's engine. You know? right. so, so then you go to Rockingham in the spring and, and uh, go back to Junior Johnson. You're, you know, you, you always got something to eat after you went through inspection at the restaurant there at Rockingham in the infield. <laughs> We're sitting there eating, me and Rob, and Junior's a couple of tables over. Hey, why'd you run that other man's car? And like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and then Earnhardt. And then, you know, Junior was way easier to talk to than Earnhardt about it. Man, you guys would have beat him. Like, just stop. You know, you, yeah. you'll never know the whole thing, and it's not important now. We just got to whip you this year, and we did a terrible job in 91. We're, our hearts were just broken, and we didn't let them heal quick enough. 1991, things do kind of blow up yep. early in the season, and there's a lot of turmoil mm -hmm. on the team. And you're pretty much right. You are pretty much right there at ground zero in the midst of it all. How difficult was it to go through all of that? And more importantly, how did you get past it? Well, you know, I was part of that. Was that the year yeah. that I yeah. Went, yeah. went to you and yeah. we, did, we did this story? Jack was furious with me. Because Robin and, and, and the others told the truth. It followed that incident at Atlanta. 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 The, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then and you Richmond the also. Calm yeah. in the middle yeah. of the storm and you told Jack, said, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. Yeah. Which I printed. Well, there was always a lot of turmoil at Atlanta in the spring because it coincided with Jack racing the 12 hours at Sebring. Sebring, yeah. So poor old Jack, you know, he's got 100 balls in the air, and he comes to watch us qualify on Friday and, and work with us. I mean, not just watch. He was a hand, for sure a hands-on guy, still is. But uh, he, he works his tail off on Friday and hauls butt to, 
to Sebring and worries about all that there and stays up till midnight and flies in, gets home, at, gets to land at the airport uh, hotel at two o'clock in the morning and didn't have a room. So he's beating on the door. I said, just come in with me. <laughs> just, just live with me, you know. And the yeah. next morning, yeah. Jack's exhausted and frustrated. And, you know, it's just a really tough thing. And we left, the, Robin's brother left a, a jack screw wrench in the, in the yeah. hole and we had to come back in and Robin's frustrated with NASCAR, and, you know, they're right up there, and Robin's making all kinds of hand gestures to him, and <laughs> Jack wants to be mad at Robin because he thought Robin was looking out for his brother, and, you know, Jack was very, very careful about uh, family things. He, you know what I mean? He, didn't, he, he would fire his son as soon as he fired anybody, and by God, the rest of you guys are going to be like that, too. And we were, but at that point, Jack didn't realize that Robin was just mad about the situation, not about his brother being the guy. But right. Anyway, the next morning, Robin's fired, and it's all a mess, and Ryan's got to go home. And Robin couldn't even take his company car home. I had to drive him home, and he and I are friends since we're 12 years old. And I'm like, man, I, I, we'll fix this, Rob. Just please, everybody, just slow down, yeah. you know. And, and then Jack got offended because I said, well, Jack, went through a lot because of his Sebring thing, and he thought I had made him out to be a wimp because he couldn't go do a 12-hour race and not do one the next. So he's mad yeah. at me now. Yeah. And I, I was just, I'm just explaining things, you know. I didn't get mad about anything. A week later, I found out he's super mad at me, you know. And I'm like, oh, man. You know, obviously, we don't know each other very well. So, and there were other things. Robin, people, you know, we had come a long ways, and Robin, owners were talking to Robin. And Jimmy Maycar was getting ready to leave Penske to start Gibbs, which he's still there and doing a fantastic yeah, job. Still. Who could ever have dreamed that they'd have three of the top four? And uh, so Penske calls me. And, uh, yeah, I'll come, I'll come see you, just see what's going on. You know, because I'm in kind of a tough situation, and it's very, very tense. And... Uh, but anyway, ultimately, I, I didn't want to do that. Uh, I didn't want to move my family to Mooresville or Lake Norman or whatever. But Jack heard about it, and he grabbed me and drug me off into a car, and he said, man, you know, I did this, and I did that. I said, Jack, you got to understand, we did this, and we did that. It's not, you know I mean? If there was somebody that didn't know much about stock car racing, it would have been you. Yeah. And we did a lot of things to, so we all learned together. Jack only really wanted to listen to Leonard Wood. He loved Leonard Wood, uh -huh. which we all do. Sure. But, but if somebody told him something about a carburetor or what have you, uh, if it didn't come through Leonard, you know, I remember we were at Talladega one time really struggling with a play car, and uh, it rained the race out. And we all got in the van going back to the hotel. And, you know, Jack's frustrated because I'm sure he had a thousand meetings to do Monday in Livonia. He had a huge company. He still does. Bigger now than ever. And uh, I said, Jack, I don't know what's going on, but... Bud Moore's got four 100 jets in his carburetor. He said, so what do you want me to do, Steve? Put four 100 jets in a carburetor? I said, no, no. And he got so, gosh, he was so mad at me. I said, Jack, I'm not telling you how to jet your carburetors, man. But there's something going on that allows him to do that. And that was another time he thought I was saying he didn't know what he was doing. And all I was doing was saying, hey, there's... Something happened in these manifolds or whatever. You know, it was only like the third year with plates. 87, 88, 89, yeah. And, and later, we found out that when you got your manifold right, you would run four 96 to 100 jets all the way around in the carburetor. But it, it was just, there were just a number of things that always had you saying, man, you know, every time the phone rang, you're like, oh, my God, what, how, what have I done? What I mean, now? I, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to do the best I can do, yeah. talking to people as straight as I can talk to them, and I'm in trouble again. And uh, what's his name? The fellow from Mulhern. You know, yeah, Mulhern, Mulhern just. Oh, uh, get on Mulhern. And I love him. I love Mike Mel <laughs> Mulhern. But my God, he would catch on something and would not turn it loose. I'm like, Mike, please just stop. I mean, you're, you're ruining a race team here. You know, right. it was the internal strife right. was. Unbelievable in 91, yeah.